So, more optimistically, positively, how do we uh, move beyond this? How do we go beyond development uh, as usual? And for me, one of the key things is about challenging these power relations. It is about standing up to powerful incumbent actors who increasingly, it's interesting for me, I've seen this a lot in the last few years, the coal industry, the oil industry, some of the key fossil fuel incumbents really making the case now that their role is tackling energy poverty. They may not have got it right on climate change, but we can't phase out too quickly because they're meeting the needs of the poor. They're making these claims uh, increasingly uh, more strongly, more vocally, more vociferously, and some of those claims, I think, uh, need to be challenged. And it's understandable, this is an old graphic, you can see that from the fact it says world development movement and not <laughs> global justice now, but it was an attempt to map these very close, intricate webs of power, political, social, institutional power, that bind government officials to financial actors and to business actors. It's a key challenge to prise those apart, to lever them, to expose them, to try and um, move things in a different direction. And I think contrary to the instincts of, of many people in the development industry, it really means focusing attention on the rich, on the 1%. So when we've got these finite carbon budgets at stake, it is about the explicit links between extreme inequality and overconsumption. And it's not popular to state that how those of us in the richer part of the world produce and consume energy, food and water, and how we meet our transport, heating and dietary needs all need to radically change. It's far more comfortable to go with this dominant narrative about the need for tweaks to pricing, to markets, plugging in different technologies, alternative energy sources, incremental policy reforms of one sort or another. But I think increasingly the time has come to put down limits rather than leave it to the market to decide which which ways forward we go, whether it's energy, food, transport. We need to address what a lot of people are referring to as supply side climate policy. So Andrew Sims and I wrote a piece in The Guardian, some of you may have seen it last, last year, calling for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. And it's got quite a lot of traction. There was a letter that Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and many others signed supporting this, and there's now an NGO coalition around this, really trying to push this forward. And it's riding with the momentum that's coming from a number of governments saying that they won't develop reserves they have of oil, coal and gas. So from Belize to Costa Rica, New Zealand, many other countries are starting to sort of say they will leave certain resources in the ground. This is what I mean by supply side policies. It's not just regulating emissions going into the atmosphere, it's keeping the stuff in the ground uh, in the first place. And this requires, I think, a more critical view of, of pricing. So although the orthodoxy, the dominant approach is to set up more and more carbon markets and emission trading schemes around the world, I would argue that we need a, a different approach, that that's unlikely to get us very far. It certainly hasn't done uh, so far. And we need to repurpose some of the key institutions of global governance, whether it's the World Bank or the WTO, to bring them in line with the Paris Agreement and more ambitious forms of climate uh, policy. And this is what I mean by this different approach. If you if you think that the climate regime, the various agreements we've had, whether it's the Framework Convention, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, they're trying to deal with one part of the story, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. What we've also seen, though, over time is increasing emphasis on payments for ecosystem services, on green carbon and blue carbon, looking at the value and the services provided by oceans, by mangroves or by forests, trying to quantify those things and then trade them to create a new site of accumulation, if you like, new business opportunities to make money out of climate change. But what I'm seeing from Extinction Rebellion, from the climate justice movement and from many others, and also this attempt we have now about a whole new approach, is to try and argue that we have to keep those resources in the ground uh, in the first place. And there are sources of hope that things are changing. There are waves of resistance that we're seeing all the time. And I noticed there was a flyer here for the um, youth climate you strike for climate tomorrow down in Brighton, please come along. Uh, this is really catching on. Um, we're seeing the rise of uh, Extinction Rebellion, but we're also seeing you know, protests all around the UK, around fracking, um, resistance to pipeline projects in the, U in the US, around Exhale and Dakota, etc., often led by environmental defenders, by indigenous peoples groups. Um, 
there's a lot going on there. And I think pushing this supply side side of things is really important. There's something now called the Powering Past Coal Coalition, which the UK is uh, exercising leadership in, slightly surprisingly. So we are still capable of exercising leadership in some things. We're powering past coal and bringing some other countries with us. Nationally, as I mentioned before, Costa Rica, an ex-IDS student who's president of Costa Rica, decided they weren't going to develop large swathes of the uh, fossil fuels that they could potentially exploit. France, Belize, New Zealand, others are doing similar sorts of things. And engaging finance, we saw last week the largest uh, sovereign wealth fund in Norway deciding to, to divest from fossil fuels. And we're seeing more and more of that uh, momentum uh, driven by the fossil fuel divestment movement. So there are some positive things going on. And I also see new models of ownership emerging. People, again, don't want to use this phrase, taking back control <laughs> in a positive way. Taking back control of food systems, energy systems, reclaiming spaces. Um, lots of the things that were in John's book on uh, uh, citizen innovation for a new economy, right? People are, they're not waiting around, they're developing, there's another phrase I've read the other day, now, um, yeah, nowtopias. And people call themselves nowtopians. They're not waiting for distant utopias to arrive. They're not deferring and waiting for elites to do this for them. They're just doing it in the here and now. So by living differently, by working by different values, by mobilizing people, uh, they're, they're building, you know, they're making transformations in the here and now. Some of this is also about reducing consumption. Again, something that's very, very difficult politically to talk about. But proposals for a four-day working week, for example, that are being tried in some parts of the world. Often these are driven by crises, the need to cut back budgets, but there are ways in which Greens are now talking about using them as a positive way of trying to reduce stress, have more time with family, reduce workload, and reduce uh, consumption patterns. Trying to address issues of planned obsolescence through repair capital cafes that are taking off, etc. These all feel like small anecdotal examples of things going on around the world, but they add up to something quite significant, I think. And given that in this lecture series we're talking about the SDGs, I wanted to also just say that I think the SDGs allow us an opportunity to do something different because they are universal, because they are interconnected. It means in theory that richer countries shouldn't be able to, probably will, but shouldn't be able to displace these problems onto poor countries through spatial or temporal fixes in quite the same way. We can't just solve our transport and energy problems by you know, taking over land and setting up, uh, you know, using land for biofuels, for example, if it's compromising food security for other people. Because though, you know, these commitments, these SDG commitments are intertwined. They are universal. I know many end up talking about them as applying largely to the global south. They do not. They apply to the global north as well. And there is some radical potential in there that I think we can use uh, in all of this. But more fundamentally and problematically, I think it means recognising the unsustainability of the current economic system. It means going beyond business as usual. So some analysis from the New Economics Foundation found that growth in OECD countries cannot be squared with halting warming at 2, 3 or 4 degrees. They were looking at different rates of, of economic growth and the extent to which they were compatible with different climate change scenarios. And what they found is that even in the most optimistic, likely uptake of low carbon energy, it was seemingly impossible to reconcile a growing global economy with a good likelihood of limiting global temperature to rise even to two degrees, let alone 